Hi, everybody. Um, welcome back to the Poetry Project. I'm Kyle DeQuian. I'm the executive director here. This is the first event of our spring season, Future Memory, and it's an incredible honor to be starting things off with Pragita Sharma and Sarah Schulman. Um, before we get into tonight's reading, I want to attend to some general structure and extend some gratitude as well. So I wanna thank Pragita and Sarah for being with us. I'd like to thank all of you who are joining. Um, I also would like to thank everyone at the Poetry Project who is making sure this event runs as smoothly and thoughtfully as possible and hopefully without any malicious intrusion. Thank you to Maddie D'Angelo, Anna Kreienberg and Roberto Montes. Um, Anna is going to drop a link for some Zoom FAQs into the chat right now. We'll keep this public chat open. It's wonderful to see folks being so um, expressive and present on the chat. Uh, and so it will remain open in case anyone wants to share accolades or admiration or just to say hello. Your microphones are switched off for the time being and you're welcome to keep your video camera either on or off. Um, please just note that this event is being recorded. So if your camera is on, your face may be visible at some point in the archived video of this event. In the bottom bar of the Zoom screen, I also want to note that there's a link for a live transcription underneath the CC icon in case anyone may appreciate having access to that feature. Um, we're doing our best to maintain safer space within this digital perimeter. And I'll ask Anna now to share with everyone our statement of safer space. If you do receive any unwanted private communication in the course of this event, please just chat anyone at the Poetry Project uh, who's identified with the appellation staff and we'll get it taken care of right away. If we were gathering tonight, as we have for 50 years, 55 years in shared place, as well as time, we would be in the parish hall of St. Mark's Church. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in this particular space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue, as well as the place I'm speaking from tonight, is built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenni Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color by the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We invite you to join us in this work from all of the different places where you are and are sharing another resource in the chat, a map through nativeland.ca, not as an endorsement of this resource's completeness, but as a starting place for those we hope might feel encouraged to consider in new ways the histories of the places where we are. We usually set up the chairs together and put them away in the parish hall at St. Mark's. And I find that even as we gather in these more remote grids, our community is still finding ways to make and hold special listening space together. So thank you for being with us and for figuring it out with us. We've made all of these online programs free and we've also continued to pay poets and artists for their readings, performances, teaching, and writing. So if you feel moved to offer your support for this work, Anna is also placing a link to donate in the chat. We planned this event to happen almost fully a year ago, and I'm grateful that it's happening now, but I was saying earlier to Prakita and Sarah that I've been grateful to spend this time that has passed with different returns and re-encounters with their work. Um, my experience of their writing has inflected and also been shaped in new ways by these shifting contexts of time, distance, action, uncertainty we continue to move through. I will say originally a really prevailing thread I perceived between the two of them was grief, the complexities and reconsiderations grief opens us into, or it might be truer to say there are different proximities to death and dying. And this led me to the way they are both thinking through history, how narratives assemble, imprint within us, circulate and come apart. But most recently, as I've gone through even newer readings of their work, not just their most recent work, but the breadth of poetry, fiction, scholarship and other writing between Sarah and Brigitte, 
my attention turns toward their deep and abiding sense of community, the ways we improvise care for one another out of necessity and constraint, our navigations of conflict, including and especially as it relates to those we love most deeply, and both the abundance and limitations of language to change how we recognize and relate to one another's fears, struggles, triumphs, and desires. So now I will move to introducing Pragita Sharma, who will read first. And then after Pragita's reading, I'll come back to introduce Sarah Shulman, who will close us out. I love in Pragita Sharma's work, her capacity for both fracture and tenderness. She writes frankly about disappointment, betrayal, cruelty, thoughtlessness, and still through these encounters and conditions, she is thinking and feeling toward an enduring plural. She writes in her poem, Contemporaries and Snobs, I have misunderstood duplicitous ways, their light bulbs as righteous forms of complexity, not calculated obfuscations, and still lands here by the poem's end, quote, the fragility of the intellectual is the same as the poet's. It's all about the I and its desperate sense of the we. This sense of we persists throughout Sharma's most recently published book, Grief Sequence, which opens up notions of grief to encompass loss, astonishment, and longing, but also intimacy, the surprising presence of new friendship, new kinds of friendship, as well as the failures of other friends and colleagues within the space and time of grief. The critical is continuous with the loving, I think because of a belief in plenitude or deeper possibility. Even writing to a you is too inadequate for me, she writes in my poem in a poetry hole with you. We must have a large sack of reciprocity. How I and we shape one another, especially in language, the habits, currencies, and disruptions of language has been a central and urgent question across her work. In addition to grief sequence and infamous landscapes, Brigitte Sharma is the author of Under Gloom, The Opening Question and Bliss to Fill. She's the founder of the conference Thinking Its Presence, Race, Creative Writing, Literary Studies and Art, and has been a recipient of the 2010 Howard Foundation Award, as well as a finalist for the 2024 Quartets Prize. She's taught at the University of Montana and now teaches at Pomona College. Please join me in welcoming Brigitte Sharma to the Poetry Project. Thanks so much, Kyle. That was really lovely. I love the Poetry Project so much. Um, I just have fond memories of, well, I wish I was, was able to be in New York so I could gather with everybody, um, but I love seeing your faces here. It's really warming and uh, it just also reminds me of the community that the Poetry Project creates. And um, I was just telling a student who's here, um, how um, important it is to find the Poetry Project and that it can be a home base for really wonderful writing. So thank you so much, Kyle, for that introduction and thank you to the Poetry Project and thank you to Sarah Schulman. I love your work and I love thinking about um, just like how you theorize, describe and your imagination and your, your fiction um, and, your, and your nonfiction. So it's really a gift to be here with you. Um, I'm just gonna try to keep an eye on the time and not read for too long, uh, but I'm gonna read a few poems from Grief Sequence and then a few new poems. I'm gonna start with, um, actually, I'll just start with the, just a few lines from Roland Barth. Um, Morning Diary really guided me through this book and just thinking about, um, like what, what I could put on the page. Not to suppress mourning, suffering, the stupid notion that time will do away with such a thing, but to change it, transform it, to shift it from a static stage, stasis, obstruction, recurrences of the same thing to a fluid state. I'm gonna start with the first poem because I think it was 2004, I read at the Poetry Project with Alice Notley. And this poem is after Alice Notley, which she, her poems helped me so much uh, through this book. On seclusion and looking out. Seclusion may kill your heart in the process of producing the love-stained stench in your poems, the ones containing boundaries of shame with their sober problems, 
bits describing loss, mirroring its inward entanglements, glow torches you have never seen before. You light them with two selves and don't wait for anything to flicker false. You can discern the lantern of a falling man who burned down his desire with tiny humiliated gestures. The mountain peak so high, thus you believe it gives you the one majestic evening you earned. Its embrace is a gentle coercion into wide wilderness, an amenable tyranny of its expansion. Grief's artillery to fill all the black clouds, that sallow blue sky, painting it with electric photographic sweeps. You have to find your strength in this. And then I was just going to um, read just a few sequences from this book. Learning without knowing, implicit, loving explicit, dying explicit, organizing implicit, institutional hate implicit, grieving explicit, compromise implicit, Dreaming, dreaming, organizational, staying in house implicit, leaving house explicit, sequence then recursion. I look at your handwriting. I look at your handwriting and it pushes space into its narrow field. His were big atmospheric box crosses with architecture. Your speech and talk are the opposite. You have soft catalectic vowels. His were hard chains of dream speak. How is this possible? What is richly characterized by handwriting? What is its dictionary of attributes? Where is there an airy space between the way he and I loved? Because then and suddenly I loved again and it arose against sequential time. This makes loving two persons its own counsel. One followed the other, but there is still yet simultaneity. The other loved me, but had trouble loving, and I had to absorb this after death. There is loving without knowing, and loving with so much knowing. Two bodies separate in the night after the coupling of evening time. One goes up to his room and slowly dies, cigarette after cigarette. After his feeding tube and bile duct were inserted, he wouldn't sleep in our bed. The two broad categories of sequence learning exist, explicit and implicit, with subcategories, which also become dreaming and reading the handwriting. You are the first person, and now you are one person, and there is a second person. Explicit sequence learning has been known and studied since the discovery of sequence learning. However, recently, implicit sequence learning has gained more intention and research. A form of implicit learning, maybe implicit dreaming, maybe a contrary dreaming occurs, maybe dying is more implicit in its sequence, maybe learning refers to the underlying methods of dreaming, or airy spaces, or writing words to both beloveds, that contrary people are unaware of what's explicit and what's implicit. In other words, learning without knowing is dreaming. Um, I'll just read one more from Grief Sequence. Um, I could just preface to say that this, this book um, really kind of tries to document a grieving period um, of the loss of my late husband, uh, the composer Dale Sherrard, who has also been involved with the Poetry Project. He loved the marathon and performed at a few of them with me and on his own. Uh, so I'll just end with this last sequence, which is a death is about his death. Now, there's many about his death in here. Um, I want to dedicate this to my friend um, who's here um, from Missoula, a Spider McKnight, who was also a New Yorker um, until she moved to Missoula long before I did. And she really helped me. Uh, she helped me so much uh, with Dale's um, dying. And I'm grateful to her and I'm grateful for our friendship. She's also in the poem. <laughs> Sequence seven. I thought he was over medicating himself and planning his suicide. I took the pills away from him. He looked defeated. He said as much. I felt sorry for both of us. His expression held this enormity and a seared exhausted center. 
spatial discomfort started to affect him, but didn't take hold until the next day when he started to lose consciousness and rattled the house yelling about thieves, robbers, drunks, and pill snatchers. We didn't know what was going on. The tumor was rapidly metastasizing its mass through his cerebellum. His body became harder to manage and he sprang fearfully through the house, tugging violently at his bile duct tube. Asia and I camped in the front rooms. The last night of intimacy, of lucidity, unbeknownst to me, we sat together huddled and I caressed him, cradling his arms, his legs, and his penis. I was sure we had time left for more, but this was the last time he spoke and searched my face and looked at me with a recognition I understood. It's how we moved out of consciousness and I'm haunted by those last days before we succumbed to hospice. I remember how stunning he was resting in bed that week before in our library with a cornflower blue sheeted bed prepared lovingly by Ashby and Spider. In that bed, an unofficial hospice, he had a look of wonder when we put movies on. He excited over Wilson, the ball and castaway and stared unblinkingly at Tom Hanks. We giggled over this and appreciated how Andrew put the Eno station on next and Asia lit and framed the sheeted bed with twinkling lamp and illuminant bulbs Dale found soothing. We all watched him compose in the air to fill up glass. I wish that we could have unleashed him to his afterlife then. That's what he would have wanted, a release to his own universe, sonant and material, an ethereal ball, an awkward Tom Hanks, a Wilson and a castaway in a glittering hand-printed sea. This death sequence was the one I wanted for him. So it's now been um, six years uh, since Dale passed. And um, I've just really, I, I don't know what my, I think I'm beeping a little bit on my computer, so please ignore that. Um, I'm, just, I'm just grateful uh, to be able to reflect and to write and to think about um, where it's brought me to. So I have a new manuscript uh, titled One Mint One, and the title is, um, it comes from, uh, uh, I, was, what, I was looking at Barnett Newman's uh, series, the One Mint One series, and I loved that, I loved looking at them. They really centered me over the last several years. I would just go to a museum and look for a, a Newman and uh, the, the line in the center, the zip. And so I looked at that title and I just thought about one mint and in my homonym mind, I wanted W-O-N. So my new manuscript is titled One Mint and then it's W-O-N, one. So in this new manuscript, I'm thinking, I'm trying to resolve the secondary traumas, um, things that disappointed me. <laughs> I guess I feel like I'm still writing hostile elegies, but now they're too, uh, maybe the living, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Uh, but I wanted to process um, ideas of race and gender and white fragility and friendship um, and uh, institutional problems. And, but also I wanted to think about the Upanishads and the uses of the Eastern, Eastern thinking on, on, you know, on the West, like how, um, how my Eastern thinking is affected in the West. And so I started to read the Upanishads and process lines. So I'm gonna stop explaining and read. So I, I don't know if I, yeah, okay. I'm like talking, see Zoom makes you talk to yourself. Um, I'll start with the poem uh, that I actually wrote in 2014 um, that is good for this new book. So I feel like it's um, kind of initiating some of the stuff in the new book but I wrote it before grief sequence. A legacy. All this noisy commotion isolated a fairly small universe of nothing special. I had faced the assistant to the incumbent, his failed face of poetry bottomless with self pride and a satisfaction that fed his wolf. And he was a wolf. And when I scoffed at him with some penetration, I could see the clamor of his wounds but also the vanity in his recognitions. He believed I was undeserving and thought it was his right to judge. And his judgment, a stun gun, took my gender and race and euthanized its center. And he thought this was an extension of the occult, 
that it was the intuition of a bright star affecting forward. I wanted him to see this in a particular light, but the particular worsened into a bruise of matter far more inhumane. And I fell into its hole, and he with his glee had no idea because his gender and race gave him the privilege to look down and see how my skeleton warped my will, but not the firmament of my broadness. And what I know now is measuring across power and enduring many luminary deficits that come out of symptoms and their fallen edges. Philip Glass comes in again. Philip Glass, it's the title of the poem. Snow dropping pellets into the synthesizer. I have curtains flattering the windows flat tones. I am in quiet reciprocity. We used to hide out together in friendship and I felt so enamored by your grace until I learned that it was not a real gesture. You were never my enemy until I learned that I was yours and that your perceptions drew people away from you. I believed in a certain fairness and respect. It's not subjective, but like Philip Glass, I will learn all there is about repetition in art and life, how to see, how to see crystallization in the syllables of falling sounds. I say this, I write that poem because I'm going to read this like long poem that I'm a little bit shy about reading. <laughs> it's a long poem. It's probably five minutes. Um, and I guess I've just read for about 13 minutes, so I'm okay. Um, this one is uh, actually, I, I, I dedicate it to Stacey Zamazic because she helped me think about this with some edits and she let me process the poem with her. Um, and I guess I could say that the poems are now moving from grief into grievances. Um, and I was really trying in this poem uh, to talk about white friendship, but really like heteronormative uh, white friendship and, um, and the dynamics of that um, and the power dynamics. Um, I had a joke with a, with a friend of mine where we just talked about how we're sidekicks, how we're brown sidekicks. So that's kind of, um, and this is about a, a friendship that ended. Friendship and racial furniture and address. One, there had been no sincere intimacy left between us and I felt freer to say what I couldn't say before. You would like it if I constructed a mirror of conformity that gazed only back at you with a crony admiration you think people have for you but I don't miss those redolent flowers stinking with a vainglorious scarcity, how their dotted eyes blink in an ivory tower vase, how to dump more onto my head, which is what you did. And so I will address a white fragility among those of you who I've been a handmaid, even as you were a witness to the racism I endured in your white world. But soon after you disparaged me and gossiped about my dead husband's fidelity and after which you bemoaned all over town about your losses, regretting that you were a witness when you thought you lost power. Without fail, you revealed yourself to be yourself and pelted this quality at me with hidden fists. Two, at first I thought you were benign, a decorative blue leather of sense-making. You had me fooled. I bought the chair, but not the comfort. I'm now seeking comfort. Nevertheless, you didn't appreciate my sometimes lack of conformity, not what informed it, my racial upbringing. It made me look unrefined. I struggled as a child to conform to my white friend's standards, and even as a child I knew this. As an adult, I fretted in the valence of this and thought about the compromise every time I experienced, sorry, this compromise every time I experienced shame in your presence. I ache in my reclining chair with the hard won consolation I now possess from effort to hope in the goodness of others. But the issue is really plain and sinister. You spoke in your truth, not sharply or astutely, about me, and I experienced every single intonation of it. How excoriating is your specialty, and you churn it like butter. How it mines good intentions, slanders, then you slather it on. Three. I was being bullied when I went 
I was being bullied, what I went through in childhood, chock full, a meanness I've seen among girls and now women who don't like women, a misogyny that builds its discourse on elitism requiring distinctions in arcane order plus a facile beauty to cajole. I saw you first as a guiding obsequious charm, the kind and a bewitching chandelier, that which is whitewashed around its candle edges, quietly scribbling names on a neoliberal clipboard, a twinkling of lit armor above the coffee table. These are my direct statements of which I have evaded until now. I am building words now with their own architectural highlights of the window pane of the portrait, and in particular, what I think about demolished friendships that have been painstakingly nurtured and who in them has the privilege and who does not. I thought to mark their endedness with the boundaries they crossed to say you are not me. Four. You have not experienced any discrimination that changed your pointed machine, white as the daylight lily gun. How sharp the coin of boundary is, I'm learning. One person is a grandiosity mashed up in acres of domestic fabric whose life never gives in to equity, believes they not need to be driven to compassion or understanding or equanimity or concession. I thought of the obsolescence and mismatched ambition and how it's pleasant to skirt around these systems of takeover, staying far away and aching for a surrealist touch. I'd rather be a useless nightlight to a peacock than to be the peacock. At least my light will brighten a dreamy shadow. Why do you think you deserve everything there is for a body or a mind to seize from desire? Our desire is the opposite of impasse. And that if we experience loss that it, as it opens us wide open to life giving us up, living does run in and out of the fleeting like a wind dead to a wooden door, but forever moving its course of action. Nothing is unchecked by vanity or a limp charity. And when you grace me with such unbecoming intention, so underhandedly mounted in unkindness. Five, I see it squarely as I have seen discriminatory eyes and brows furrow at my offending existence. It's easy to see through it when you aren't white and have felt sodden eyes of disdain in a forever mode just when you want into a room with, the in, with an innocence nobody has liked for many years. I was loyal to your ever needing wishes like my parents to employers like I was to employers. This is the sense of race relations and their crossing over to power with white women who always meant to misguide you to their boot. Beliefs can collapse race into gender and feminism is friendship with ethics. I wrote this to freedom. I wrote this to unburden myself from niceties toward those like you for whom people are disposable, our handmaids, our stuffed chairs. Just gonna keep going. <laughs> Metaphorically charged. I meant well and resisted comparisons for a while because those who might cajole me into finding their inaccuracy accurate might, lead, might need likenesses. I was meant to find myself inside a metaphor, but I wasn't there and felt disillusioned. Instead, I built the word with the bricks of what comparison might mean with another suffix. What I meant was I was keen to add nouns. I wanted to add moon to the comparison and build its condition to be matter of fact. I found the condition of the wound to be built into its state of cruelty. She said they have wounds too, and that's why they feel this way. I said, I'm not trying to wound them, but they like thinking of my wounds in a certain way. I find their wounds to affect cruelty and mine did not attend the same, intend the same effect. I'm angry at those who've been economical about what I meant, I might have meant. I'm despairing because I created meaning from a grievance nobody dared to own. They wanted the grievance to be possessed after it was vetted, and I didn't want to give it to them. And then they lied about what they thought of comparisons, which are metaphors lying about what they said they mean. I'm gonna go into just a little bit of a different tone here. <laughs> Um, this is more of the Upanishads, maybe a little bit of contemplative stuff, a little bit. Um, 
secular one mint. Throughout this fall and fall into a diminished winter with its 10,000 upturned leaves, its impervious starlight for which I was given sight to look up, Upa, having perceived the mind in an imperceptible snowed in shadow, a demarcated yellow, I was given a future to breathe in. I'm still discussing what traumas won't shake. Could they lessen in time? Why do you think I am with him? Because he is at peace with himself and brings his peace to me. There is an incalculable value in the quiet night of nonviolent affairs. I have to just preface this one by saying David Lynch did the, I think like he blurbed the Upanishads and I just couldn't, I couldn't get over it. Um, and so um, anyway, I like David Lynch, but I just get, I'm just irritated by, by it. Sunday, Sunday, Akatha December, I see in the looming white of morning. I want to feel more sentient, I say to the blankets and to my labor. I don't want the ingestible lyric of my body to blindfold me. I do wonder what David Lynch has learned from the Upanishads. I found this translation too summarizing, too commercial. I wanna to go to the other one full of repetition of that which is that or this or about intention and spirit. What words are set to become the supreme self in the making, that which is a supreme Sunday turning into a Monday. And we have, um, I have three poems. The imperishable and perishable family. There was a hun there was a husband father at one time, distinguished in phrases but not in gestures. There was a daughter circulating in vain attempts, calculating the usage of efforts. I'm afraid to say. I had painted her in pearly fabric amidst the lost husband father who blew up our foundation when he sought to line draw the exaggerations in our field. What were perished actions of the family? I thought to resuscitate it all and my cheeks blew inward. I was holding all my breath inside. This wasn't a good idea. So does this world spring from the imperishable, says the Upanishads, and led me to ask for a crystalline idiom because in finding the daughter I lost myself, I realized too late, I was granted tyranny for all the lost occasions. My therapist calls this manipulation. I decided to stake its claim. I will be done now. I knew I was the hat trick for them. And thus I'm over with the game because the game has since been done with me. I had no idea until I blew and blew and blew. This is probably more uh, literally a pandemic poem. <laughs> and um, I miss New York because New York, we do call our therapists therapists. No offense to Missoulians, but, but you often use counselor a lot. Um, so this is about, this is called therapist versus counselor. I prefer therapist because the term counselor suggests the patient is not a patient but a passerby in need of menial advice. Did you grow up by the sea or close to its New England windows? Did your psyche let in the tranquility of being near the sea? I pretend I did so I can learn more about the illustrative tide, see if it helps me breathe, if it calms my innards. But I find domestic interiors soothing like this sofa and its plush. Therapists have permanence in their furniture. I have shame that I share my sorrows and fears with the wrong people, except for my therapist, a kind grave digger excavating the figurative despair, helping me find the sweetest and bluest violets, the ones that counselors might not mention. I recount the flowers I continue to like despite what's outside of this window's frame, a troll government, an authoritarian we're trying to forget in here. And I'm going I'm to end with this poem that um, I read for the marathon. Um, and thanks so much again to everybody at the Poetry Project. A one one, 
In it, I found that the political discourse would love its ethical noon, a wonderment, a one sum, bewitching affinities built upon antinomies, abstract, an expression, a wool cap of ornament for the sake of weather. Loving him helpless anew helped, loving her helplessly anew helped, leaving it all behind helplessly helped. Building around the moribund became a kind of blessing. I left constituents around the number one and I won and I felt simple or glad or finally incandescent and comfortably large in my honesty. A kind of hanging of the rituals, the clothes, the sense of living in them upright. I felt trouble pinging from my thumb muscles, but I ignored the throb. I looked out and out into a dense and driven fog and said goodbye to its flavor. I said goodbye to more than 10 years of saying, will you please love me? I wanted to birth a kind of abstract expressionism of the merely objective and the racialized lover of things. One mint or ornament, or I won an ornament, or I loved an ornament, and the one mint of myself resolved. I resolved, and thus I, and thus I became into myself a one that I thought would never be allowed. And I moved outside of the fog into a place that signified art. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brigitte. Wow, that was generous and tremendous um, and just incredible. Thank you so, so much. Um, I also wanna remind folks that we have um, book sale links for both Brigitte and Sarah. Um, and I think as soon as the, the admirations finish rolling through, um, Anna is going to place into the chat some links for Pragita's book, Grief Sequence, as well as Under Gloom, and the pre-order link for Sarah's uh, book, Let the Record Show. So thank you again, Pragita. Um, and I'm gonna turn now to introducing Sarah Schulman. Um, I have listened many times to a 1990 recording of Sarah Schulman at the Poetry Project, reading from her work, People in Trouble which she begins with a dedication to Kevin Smith, Oliver Johnson, Bob Smith, Vito Russo, Ray Navarro, and Tim DeLugos, all of whom had died of AIDS-related complications in the five weeks preceding her reading. And she proceeds from there with this first sentence from the book, of, from the first sentence of her reading. It was the beginning of the end of the world, but not everyone noticed right away. Some people were dying. Some people were busy. Some people were cleaning their houses while the war movie played on television. I'm drawn to this recording because I think it is illustrative of a kind of poetics that runs through Sarah Schulman's work. Yes, she has written expansively with critical precision about AIDS activism and people with AIDS. It's central in that 1990 fictional work and this essential work she has forthcoming from FSG in May, Let the Record Show, a political history of ACT UP New York. But really what I hear in this recording and what I follow across a number of other subjects and contexts is a broader radical devotion to people. And I wanna say people instead of audience. I think we are moved so deeply by Sarah Schulman's history, fiction, criticism and plays because the sense of her being among is so clearly and passionately felt. She's really writing and thinking as close to community as possible. Even in her earliest work, I think about the entangled detective work and romance of After Dolores, um, Schulman's intuitive sense of relation, her care for relation, its surprises and unravelings is abundantly apparent. And then I turn to more recent work, like the vastly influential Conflict is Not Abuse. And I find in all of its conceptual brilliance, a very substantive and lived sense of application. Or her novel, The Cosmopolitans, where two people outcast in different ways from their families and communities find unlikely companionship in one another. And this should also be said again and again, Sarah Schulman calls us to the margin as the place where truly original invention and solidarity are forged. 
She listens and speaks to the margin and she reminds us of the forces, the institutional forces, including very much the cultural institutional forces, which maintain pernicious systems of exclusion and inequity. I'm grateful for her clarity of commitment, vision, inquiry. I'm grateful for the generosity of her presence in the Poetry Project's community over time. And I'm very grateful that she will be sharing with us tonight some new fiction. Please welcome Sarah Schulman to the Poetry Project. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pragita. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you to everybody who's shown up, including some long lost friends and people I haven't spoken to in years. I'm so glad you're there. So I've been reading at the Poetry Project for over half my life. I think my first reading was with Grace Paley and it was a fundraiser for El Salvador. So that dates me. So I loved when I come to read at the Poetry Project, I love to read brand new work in progress because I'm home. So I'm gonna to read to you from a novel that I'm writing now. And I guess it's about what is healing really and what do we gain from it and what do we give up? What do we lose from it? And especially for women, what is the wish to be important and how does that relate to healing and how does that aid it and how does that impede it? So let's just see what happens, okay. One. Columbus, Georgia, 1930. Vinnie Copeland Jackson is a young black woman in a segregated Southern town. She is working in a white family's kitchen. And that evening, the man who would soon be her husband is taking her to colored night at the county fair. Lula Carson Smith, the daughter of Vinnie's employer spends the entire hot afternoon asking annoying questions like a fly. Buzz, 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 it's all noise. Vinnie's mind is not on the laundry she is ironing, but is on the heat, the day, the light, the long fingers of the man who is coming to call on her. What is a boy? Lula asks. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Two, Columbus, Georgia, 1933. Church is the center of life. Church going inspires collective responsibility as each one tolerates and enjoys being seen by the other's attendant. Bessie, Rita May, and Allison had stepped up to the honorable obligation of that enlightenment. While Rita was trying, at 19 and only married one year, she found her first pregnancy to be extremely uncomfortable, sweating and straining against the weight, the lack of balance, her husband's disappointments in the bedroom, and her anxieties about the future potential for love of this child. The streets of Columbus, Georgia were shady, but the lack of breeze is what Rita May, did Rita May in. The problem was not sun beating down on her as it did on Frank and the other young men working construction on Warm Springs Road. The month of June brought those hot rains, adding to everyone's suffering, Water should be the soother, like Jesus's love, but summer storms left no clarity, no refreshment. Rita May wanted to sit on the porch with some chipped ice and some strong tea, but there was no ice and no one to chip it. She could barely reach the stove and it was too hot to boil water. So when Bessie and Allison came stomping down the road, energized with devotion to the greater good and seemingly unaffected by the summer sun, Rita May felt sure very sure that these older sisters from the First Baptist congregation were on a mission of mercy, or at least distraction. Bessie and Allison were older, respected, and knew how to live. So when they'd come calling, Rita May was happy to be told what to do. If Bessie and Allison wanted her to accompany them to the Smith house, then she was freed from trying to think straight and straining to keep the household as organized as Frank wanted it to always be. The three women walked slowly, but with determination to the edge of the white district, turning up Stark Avenue and approached a very modest home. The house seemed so simple from the outside, small, compact, lacking in legacy and status that the threat that loomed within diminished to Rita May. How could something so plain be so dangerous? 
dangerous enough to warrant this unplanned emergency intervention by the women's club of First Baptist. The door opened as they reached the lip of the front yard. An old young man whose sadness preceded him, Lamar Smith, slowly emerged. His appearance was entirely coincidental, for had he any idea that church, leaders were, church ladies were arriving for a confrontation on morality, he would have hidden in the basement. The creaky movement of the simple white front door allowed the overpowering sound of Rachmaninoff's first piano concerto to ricochet across the silent street. This was not a Victrola wound up tight. No, this was a human hand on a tiny piano playing with gusto, control, and will. The ladies halted in unison at its sound, confused a bit. Music of this nature normally came at a recital on a special occasion. It was not the backdrop of a hot Georgia afternoon and certainly not the soundtrack for a committee on attack. Lamar looked up in fear, touched his brim, half in greeting and half in protection, and hurried out the front path before the women could even approach. Mr. Smith, Bessie called out. Mr. Smith, Lamar, called Allison, who'd known him since Sunday school. Rita stood behind them, the heat of her swollen feet radiating up to meet the cascades of sweat drenching her back and neck. But Lamar's shoulders hunched as he turned and ran in the wrong direction assuredly opposite from his need and intention. It's about your daughter, Allison shouted. This information confirmed for Lamar that the sooner he was safely in his watch repair shop, the happier he would be. And he picked up the pace, disappearing around the bend, far from the path to downtown. His daughter, Lula, was not something within his power to control. And this was a lesson learned long ago. Inflamed by rejection, they skittled up the stairs. Bessie knocked, no response. Then she knocked louder. But Rita May had remained standing on the grass, suddenly overcome by Rachmaninoff. The absurdity of her condition and the blanketing beauty of the music and performance kept her riveted in place. There was no escape for Rita May on this earth, and only the heavenly power of live music could soothe her pain. Allison boldly climbed to the top step and looked right into the house through the front window, daring its inhabitants to ignore her. And there she saw Lula Smith, 14 years of impropriety, gamine and explosive, wildly emoting as she played the small upright. Her mother, Marguerite Carson Smith, watched Lula with an unbecoming pride. Since childhood, Marguerite had been lavish in her kindness a woman possessed of thick gentility, coating all conflict and refusing all criticism. She sat smiling, beaming, as her daughter displayed emotions too big for a pool hall and certainly not appropriate for any polite society in any town in Georgia. Allison rapped on the window. Marguerite looked up smiling in surprise, joy of recognition waved and then quietly opened the door while continuing to listen to her child play the piano. In this way, Bessie, Allison, and Rita May were dominated as they were welcomed. Nervous at the lack of recognizable protocol, the ladies feigned humility as they stepped into the tiny living room. They stood awkwardly while Lula continued to play perfectly until the movement's resolution. The beauty of her creation was their punishment. Finally, the piece concluded. Lula, pale to the point of translucence, thin with careless stringy hair and almost buck teeth, sat back overcome by her own talent. And Marguerite sat just as quietly, joining in the explosion of passion. Rita May was almost embarrassed at the intimacy of the situation, while Bessie and Allison became more and more frustrated by being ignored. This is proof, Marguerite whispered in a lulling, sweet, post-coital sing-song, that the spirit can leave the body. Is that what sex is like, Mama? Lula asked, speaking the unspeakable like she was asking for the time. Is sex like music? It must be. People make art the way they make love, right, Mother? Marguerite! Bessie could not contain herself any longer. 
No one in Georgia ever talked about sex, not lovers, not mothers, and not neighbors in polite company on afternoons in living rooms. This was far worse than the women of First Baptist had come to understand. Marguerite was a pale haired woman. She had a deep beauty, but not a surface one. That is to say she had sensuality, though no one would understand that from afar. She rose with that loving, sincere smile, still carelessly on her lips and stroked Lula's hair. Why, hello, she cooed, indicating her sofa and armchair to her guests as if they had just arrived instead of standing uncomfortably scorned and subjected to improprieties so improper as to defy categorization. Welcome to my home. Rita was so happy to be able to sit on the modest sofa that she barely remembered why they were there, but Bessie seized the armchair and tried to take command of the situation. Marguerite, we have been sent by the Ladies' Committee of First Baptist. We are all very concerned about Lula Smith. I've changed my name to Carson, the girl interjected, as though nothing else was more important than her eccentric whim. That is a boy's name. That's what an artist is, Marguerite said with a smile and a kind tone, hiding her opposition. The proof of somewhere better, eternally elsewhere. She offered a dish of green candies to her guests. Rita May took two. Carson stood up from the piano bench to grab a handful of sweets. And at that moment, Bessie, Allison, and even the confused and displaced Rita May all gasped, honestly and collectively. Carson Smith was wearing pants. Three, 1933. Vinnie Copeland Jackson hung out the last item of someone else's laundry for the day. She knew the yellow urine stains in Mr. Smith's pants and the swipes of excrement left on Mrs. Smith's undies. This was the information that she did not want and did not need. It was an invasion on her heart and on her spirit. Yet, if she was going to move to Atlanta, she would have to have those letters of reference. Stepping out of the kitchen into the front room, she was surprised to see that the Smiths had company, some white ladies with a hovering air of dirty business. Mrs. Smith, I finished the heavy washing. Mrs. Mullen says you can pay her for my time. Vinny took her hat and bag from the coat tree by the front door. She knew this would make an impression on the visiting ladies who never allowed Negroes in and out of their front doors unless they were carrying heavy furniture. The Smiths were eccentric. They were not radical race mixers like the communists Vinnie's father entertained at home, but they behaved differently from many white folks simply because of their embrace of strange behaviors. Thank you, Vinnie. Marguerite did not offer her a candy. See you next Sunday. Mrs. Smith, I am getting married next Sunday. Married? Carson was stunned. Vinnie worried that she might make a scene. That child wanted to be part of Vinnie's life to an extent that surpassed most children in the care of Negro women. It wasn't only that she wanted to be the center of Vinnie's attention, they were all that way, but she wanted to know where Vinnie went and what she did. While most white families left the Negroes to their own secret collective lives, unable to imagine anything of value taking place there. But Vinny had long understood that Carson wanted to be part of colored people's lives because it was separate and away from her own society. That child didn't want to be excluded from anything that she felt could hold some place of freedom. And Vinny had come to see that Carson, like most white people, felt they had the right to go anywhere. Can I come to your wedding? Carson sat on the edge of her piano bench, ready to leap. Well, congratulations, Marguerite smiled in her natural defensive kindness, almost invisible behind the shower of empathetic joy. Thank you, Mrs. Smith. And she was gone. Four, Paris, France, 1952. Did Reeves understand that he was being deranged? Easy to gild the self-deception and demon rum, but rage comes from a truth. That's its enticement. So, so seductive. Feels like an act of goodness to spill, spill a facsimile of a truth. No bloodletting blood of real hatred comes from a complete lie. 
It would be like claiming the wind from above that surrounds us and carries us, impedes us and chills and warms us, declaring that all of this goodness and threat of the natural world originated in a human heart instead of from God. What would be the point? But when the rage is at his own, well, his own failure to do what he was put on this earth to do, when it is just his own damn inconsistency, then the blistering drink in one hand and sweaty gesticulation, the tears, the loud booming voice never getting to any real point, well, that is all blame. And Carson did not want to be blamed. There was nothing she could make of blame that would enhance any feeling or sentence. It was no help at all. She had another cocktail and kept one eye on her cane. Reeves had to be completely disregarded, no matter what the consequence. After all, Carson McCullers was more than herself, and Reeves was not. Harris, 1952, one hour later, 3 a.m. Reeves McCullers was only in his late 30s, but that's when the monster devours the child. Drunk and dirty, he seemed barely able to stand, and yet he was determined to complete the devil's whim. Chestnut aisles, eyes paled, suntan skin the color of milk, hair to straw, but a great smile. Yes, a stupid girl could still fall in love with him on a bar stool. The apartment was stark, one of those Parisian walk-ups, no elevators. Back home in the old French village, old ladies climbed the hillside at the end of the day carrying their buckets of milk. Now they drag mop water up the stairs. It's because of that view, that gorgeous town. Everyone wants a peak of Paris and it's lost in future empires, the brutality, the glamor of gold and lucre of glamor. Columbus, Georgia has nothing to look at but a, the river on a lazy day. The buildings are low and hide from each other except for insistent Baptist steeples and the highbrow Methodist tower. Columbus shows itself like a young girl at the Follies Bergere. She's one in a million, but there have been thousands like her. While Paris is the pearl in the necklace nestled between the showgirl's breasts. She is unique, handcrafted, expensive, and whoever possesses Paris is loved. Every gorgeous lady is outshone by her city. Now that is competition. A shitty walk-up apartment in Paris had its own charms, perhaps. Carson found that it grounded her away from the cloister of New York and back into the sounds of washerwomen and bartenders passing at dawn, children with inside and loose animals. It was way beyond 2 a.m. at this point and three and four and Reeves was drunk, dirty and deranged as usual, but this time clutching a rope in his hand. Occasionally a car rolled down the cobblestones, but otherwise the noise was within, within their souls. These two, it had finally come to this. Reeves, though young, carried a weight of decline and could have passed for 60. And Carson at 35 seemed even more broken. She was also drunk and shrunken in her worn out robe that deprived her of detail. Half her body was paralyzed now from a series of avoidable strokes that she had not avoided. When I die, Reeves sweated as he wrapped the rope around his fingers and pulled it taut. You will have no one to take care of you. Carson was actually frightened this time and she was wide-eyed, yet she behaved in a dismissive manner towards her husband, purely by habit. She no longer made decisions to be hurtful or mean. It no longer was a mask of deeper feeling or a way of conferring her own anxieties onto the person in front of her. By now, these escalating cruelties were compulsive. The machine was in play with no one at the wheel. Given that something dreadful could easily occur, she might have been more strategic, but Carson McCullers had lost that option three cocktails before. In order to get what one wants, one has to know what one wants after all, and it has to be attainable, but there is nothing real to try to get. In order to feel endangered, one must above all feel. These were the complications engulfing her that night. She had no idea who or what she was and no map of how to live her life. Yet, she had determination, but for what? Don't start, she whispered, the way one does to a tiny little child when mother has better things to do. Reeves' face softened. Admit it. This was not an act. This was as real as he had ever been. The best thing would be for the two of us to die together. Stop that, she spit. It was one of those moments. What if Carson had said, Reeves, I don't want you to die. I love you. 
then the evening would have played out so differently. But since she was drunk, she wasn't kind. Instead, she made accusations. She used a tone that absolved her of anything but innocence. It was the fork in the road moment and she made the cheap choice, the one almost everyone makes. It's true, Reeves whimpered. He was very weak right now. Oh, my books, Carson will explain. I'm alive, I exist. Carson, you're an invalid. You're never gonna get better. Let's end the suffering for both of us. It's not my fault, she said, that you don't mean anything. Perhaps there had been a way to dissuade Reeves, but now it was no longer an option. He had pre-cut the rope into two even pieces and threw them up around the rafter. Oh, please, Reeves, she slurred. If you must commit suicide, please do it somewhere else. I tell you, he swayed, eyes unfocused, hair flat with sweat. It's the best thing for us both. Freshen my drink. Ever obedient, even on the brink of disappearance, Reese turned into the kitchen. Carson then began to slowly inch off her chair. No shoes, no cane in her robe. Where is the brandy, he called. Under the sink and Reeves, wash the glass and chip the ice. It had been three strokes now and Carson's left side did not work. Yet while she lacked a forceful body, she possessed great meaning. Carson existed beyond herself in the eyes and hearts of others. And this gave her the power to survive. So as Reeves prepared their final cocktails, she dragged herself out the front door and down the staircase on her bony behind. When Reeves staggered back, the room was empty and he was just too blotto to do anything about it. Yet he did succeed in taking his own life, only his own, some weeks later with a handful of pills. Carson sailed home to New York Harbor and told everyone about the accident. A car, it seems, had crashed. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, Sarah. That was intense and expansive and surprising. And I can't wait to follow where this constellation of subjects um, turn to in the rest of the work. Um, I'm so, so grateful to both Pragita Sharma and Sarah Schulman and really appreciative to everyone who's also been so like beautifully present in the chat <laughs> through the course of this event. Um, it's really great to feel everyone's listening in this kind of atomized space that we're all sharing. Um, uh, I want to encourage everyone again, buy the work and support the work of these two brilliant writers. Um, brilliant, prolific, amazing, necessary thinkers and presences in our community. Um, I also want to let you know about the events that we have coming up. Next week is a full week. On Monday, we have Camden Ishmael Hilliard and Carlos Lara reading. Then on Wednesday, Jameson Fitzpatrick and Natalie Shapiro. On Thursday, the Anchorist Syndicate will be facilitating My Smutty Valentine, Queer Kinships and Poetics of Smut. And on Friday, Anais Duplan will read with the poet and performer Golden. Um, and now we'll turn folks' microphones on. Um, let's say that we'll keep the Zoom open at most for about 10 minutes, so until 9.20 or so, uh, and we'll close when things feel right.